copy of our youth Bible. And um, I've been praying for her, and I'm looking forward to my next visit to the Travel Lodge when I can ask her how she's been getting on, because she told me she was going to start reading it. Isn't it wonderful that we can encounter people in all sorts of unexpected places and um, discover um, that God is at work? Um, and sometimes when we least expect it, God is doing something exciting like that. Well, thank you so much, not only for your welcome today, but also for your support of Bible Society and your interest in our ministry. And um, it's a, a pleasure that we partner with churches up and down the country to help us to do the work that we do and um, to be able to resource other Bible societies, as I was saying earlier, who do not have the same degree of financial resources to be able to put Bibles into their own language. So, to, turning to our theme this evening, open the book. Does anyone know in which building you find the following scripture? Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labour in vain. Any answers from the floor? I'm opening up. Yes, there we are. So, in the central lobby of the Houses of Parliament... Inscribed in the stonework is that verse. Unless the Lord builds this house, the labourers, the builders labour in vain. Isn't it amazing that scripture is at the very foundation of our nation? Um, and as indeed it is of many other nations too. And at a time like this, when we experience so much political division so much fragmentation in our society, so much argumentation and everything else going on. Isn't it amazing that even inscribed on the walls of the building are the very words of God crying out to look to him? Scripture has informed, shaped and provided the foundations for our nation. But of course ours wasn't the first nation of which that is true. And so we turn our attention to the passage this evening. So, first of all, we need to um, just think a little bit about the background. Now, um, some people love history and geography, some people not big fans of history and geography. So if you're a fan of it, you're going to get about three or four minutes now. If you're not a fan of it, the good news is it's all over in three or four minutes. Okay. So... <clears throat> Um, so where are we in the storyline of the Old Testament? So um, <clears throat> the, the gradual slide through the kings has got worse and worse and worse. The northern kingdoms were um, overtaken by the Assyrians in 722 BC. Um, Judah, um, the su which is basically the southernmost two kingdoms because Judah swallows up Benjamin, um, survives about another 150 years till about 586. Now in 597, so 13 years before that, the area is surrounded and many of the young men in particular who were going to be the rulers of tomorrow were deported back to Babylon, uh, sorry, deported to Babylon. A long, hot journey um, and you can see the kind of route that would have been taken there. The reason for the funny shape of it is because you've got a big desert in the way, so you couldn't go straight across. So it's called the Fertile <coughs> Crescent. Um, and that was people like, you will remember, Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, these kind of people. That's, that group of people were taken over into Babylon then. And then in 586, Judah finally falls. It is sacked by the Babylonians, who are by now the regional power, they've beaten up the Assyrians, the Egyptians, and now they've taken over Judah. The place is devastated, devastated by attack. And again, further people deported um, to Babylon, and many people just left there amongst the ruins in a kind of weakened state. Now, you'll probably remember the story earlier in Nehemiah, where Nehemiah, who's cupbearer to the king, has this interaction. Now, in the meantime, and again, this refers to something I said earlier, world history moves fast. 
because by now the Babylonians are no longer the world power. By now they've been taken over by the Medes and the Persians. So we're talking 445 BC, so 130-odd years after Judah has fallen. And Nehemiah is cupbearer to the king. And, of course, the cupbearer was the most trusted position you could have because the cupbearer had to sample the wine before it went to the king to check it wasn't poisoned. So you had to have a very good relationship with your cupbearer, otherwise you could well um, be in some sticky trouble. Um, And so Nehemiah has this um, amazing experience of weeping about the state of Jerusalem. He hears what has gone on in Jerusalem, and he is mourning for the state of that place that's home that's the family home and it is in ruins and so the king picks up on the fact that he is um, in this uh, emotional state and asks him why and then he describes the uh, the situation there and the king allows him to go back to start rebuilding the city walls so Nehemiah heads back with a team of people to do that and uh, Ezra is the priest. So he's, um, <clears throat> if you like, Nehemiah's like the governmental leader, and, um, uh, and Ezra is the priest. So there we are. One of the things that I've um, reflected on in my life. I haven't lived abroad very much, but I did live abroad in South Africa for three months when I was at university. I was studying engineering and I was on the world's largest platinum mine doing my three years between second of second year and third year. Um, <clears throat> and what I discovered is this you never discover how British you are unless you live abroad. Because all the things we assume that are normal suddenly become abnormal. So I was in South Africa and I was asking myself the question, why doesn't everybody have a cup of tea at four o'clock in the afternoon? It seems a very strange thing. Um, And so it was with those who had been deported to Babylon. That group of people, and you'll remember Daniel's struggles with his um, spirituality. How could I be in the Babylonian civil service, if you like, um, paying attention to all their writings which were talking of their gods, when in fact I worship Yahweh, the God of Israel, and he has this big challenge. Well, those who were those who were over in, in Babylon were those, in a sense, who became the most zealous of the believers because their faith was under constant persecution and challenge. And they had to work out why they believed what they believe. Um, And so often it's the case in our world, isn't it, that those who are under greatest scrutiny discover perhaps most clearly the centrality of Jesus and the cross and because that's all they have, that's all they can depend on. And uh, whereas we do depend on him, it's easy for us to get distracted by the comforts and everything else that we have in our lives. And so this group of people who are over here, when they come back to Jerusalem and their families have been constantly retelling down the generations about Yahweh and, uh, and all the practices, they come back and they think to themselves, hang on. You who are here, you're not very observant. You're not very zealous for God. And so that you have this unusual mixture of peoples at this point. So Ezra tells us of the first return, which ultimately led to the rebuilt temple. But it wasn't without the returnees having to be castigated for being more interested in their own houses than they were for the house of God. They got distracted. It's not a bad thing to build a good house for yourself, but they got so distracted by that they had lost their vision for the temple. So Ezra himself returns and places God's law at the heart of the society. 
But it meant he had to tackle all sorts of other thorny issues about those who'd intermarried with other tribes. And it was not all plain sailing. And whilst we read the text nearly two and a half, read the text nearly two and a half thousand years later in a rather flat and unemotional way, this was an adventure with a lot of twists and turns, heartbreaks and encouragements in equal measure. So, the community is settling in, getting established in the land that they'd been promised from the times of Moses and Abraham. Yet for this to be a community of Yahweh, God as sovereign, there was a vital community event to be enjoyed, the reading of the law. So in verse 1 we saw all the people gathered in the square. This seems spontaneous as we read it, uh, but had almost certainly been planned as a centerpiece event for the foundation of this community. Um, They didn't have the Um, the wonders of WhatsApp or text messaging or whatever else you like. They had to probably plan this, but they were very good at word of mouth in those days. Everybody told everybody else, family to family. And so here they are, they're gathering together at the centre of this renewed community. Can you imagine the anticipation as Ezra brings out the book of the law of Moses which is probably what we know as Deuteronomy. And he comes up onto a high wooden platform, so high that all the crowds could see him, and he's joined by the community leaders to show unity around the contents of the teaching. Thank you, Barbara, for dealing with all those long words there. They were the community leaders all on this platform with Ezra in the middle with the book. Now, I don't know if you've been to a concert, maybe an orchestral concert or a band, and you've been particularly looking forward to one particular piece of music. And you're there in the audience, surrounded by people, and that piece of music is the very last thing in the programme. Do you get that sense of anticipation that you've been waiting for this moment as the orchestra or the band strike up at that particular moment. That's like this moment when he opens the book. Wow, what a moment. And the people respond by standing up as a sign of awe and respect. When opening the book, it leads to the praise of God, led by Ezra, followed by the people, with their hand in the air, They show their devotion to the Lord in verse 6. Okay, on to the next slide. One of the um, projects um, that we're involved in is Open the Book. Have you got an Open the Book team around here? Is that a team you've got around here? So Open the Book is a team who go into primary schools to um, act out Bible stories. And it is phenomenally successful. I think 18% of schools in the country now have an open the book team. It is a phenomenally successful thing. Uh, One reason it's very successful is it makes life very easy for the school. Because basically the team say, we will fulfill your um, religious assembly requirement by coming in and doing it for you. And we'll also involve the children. So there's also a drama element of it. Um, And, you know, it's brilliantly scripted and it's all uh, well worked uh, within the framework of the national curriculum. And they all, and a lot of them make their own costumes, they dress up in the costumes themselves, and then they have costumes for children who wish to volunteer to be part of it. And they act out Bible stories week by week. And a lot of the children think this is the highlight of the week for them. And these are children, many of whom never go anywhere near a church. They are being taught to be part of the Bible story as, in a sense, the first experience of their family. And it's loved by teachers and pupils 
alike. And it kind of epitomizes Bible society, that it's a, a project that actually grew up outside of Bible society, but the people came to the organization and said, we need to be part of something bigger in order to fulfill all that God is calling us to. So without restricting what they do, they've become part of our team. You see, by reading the word and passing it down through the generations, we can remember the acts of God in the past and we instill that place in God's community that is ours, that cannot be taken away from us. So why not share it with those who don't yet know it for themselves? I love the stories of the tribes east of the Jordan. Um, you, you'll probably be familiar with the kind of um, the expedition to take the promised land. And um, if you'll remember, east of the Jordan, so they, they started dividing up the land, but east of the Jordan, um, there were two and a half tribes because that, that was the land they were given. There wasn't enough room for them west of the Jordan. And that was Reuben, Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh. And you can read about them in Joshua 22 and other places. There's a very interesting incident that occurs there, which is that um, after they've been given their plot of la- plots of land, because uh, they've helped win all the land the other side of the Jordan with everyone else, they've all been on the same team together, they're then left to get on and start establishing their own communities. And they build a set of memorial stones where they are. Now, this is away from where the main centre of the community is over in the west of the Jordan. And one day, the communities from the west of the Jordan come over and say, hang on a minute, you're doing your own thing over here, creating an altar, and uh, you, you know, you sh- you're, you're in a sense declaring that you're different to us and you want away from us, and, and you know, they were under serious threat of, of violence and uh, being cast out. But the people, Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh on the east side of the Jordan said this, no, you misunderstand. It's not an altar as a rival to what's going on over there. In fact, it's not an altar at all. These are memorial stones that we want to build here so that our subsequent generations will know that we are part of this bigger group of people. It's actually a reminder to subsequent generations of why we are where we are, but we are part of this bigger group of people. And I love that sense of passing down the generations, what the foundations of our lives are, as the word of God is our foundation. So, moving on in our passage, verses 7 and 8, the Levites explain the text, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people understood what was being read. So it's important, isn't it, to have, in in this case, the priests explaining the word. That's why we have people who explain the text to us. It's not to put their own spin on it. We should all be very cautious, those of us who do speak in public, of putting our own spin on the text of the word of God. But it is to try and help the wider community of people to understand what is being said in this book. The audience that the Levites were speaking to were this very mixed audience. Those who were become very zealous in their faith and those who'd lost their way. <clears throat> the Bible is a wonderful record of events. It's got teaching, it's got poetry it's got visions it's got all sorts of different genre of material but sometimes it can be difficult to understand and uh, therefore we need to do everything that we can to make it as accessible to people as possible and not just expect everybody to go to bible college for three years so our next slide um, shows another of our initiatives which is the good news youth bible Um, This was produced last year, and we got together with Youth for Christ and thought we would plan a new version of the Bible that would help young people to engage with it. And both organisations had the same idea, which was this. Why don't we get young people to design it? 
rather than design it for them. So we got a group of young people together for two days to brainstorm lots of different ideas. And they came up with this design for the Youth Bible. They haven't changed any of the text, but what they've created is a journaling Bible, lots of space for doodling, writing your own questions in there, little helps in there, um, sections at the back about all the issues that 12 to 18-year-olds are most preoccupied with and how the Bible can help them in those areas, all packaged in a wonderful way. And two Thursdays ago, it won Bible of the year from the Christian Booksellers Guild in London. So we're very excited about that. And when I was um, selling these at uh, the New Wine Festival in the summer, um, it was really funny, but we had quite a few embarrassed adults coming up to us and saying, is it all right if we get one of these? Because we've been looking for a really good journaling Bible for ages. Uh, I said, of course, of course. We're not going to stop anyone over the age of 18 getting one. But that's an example of trying to make the scriptures as accessible as possible. On to our next slide. So, with the open book being read, the response of the people was weeping as they heard the words of the law being read. A deep conviction of their sin as the law is digested. Now, we all know what sin looks like it's us putting ourselves front and center of all of our lives and turning our back on God just doing our own thing being selfish and deliberately rebellious the law as it is read out of course could not save them it cannot save us Rather, it points out the ideal standard for God's community and therefore our need for his grace. We cannot do it on our own is the most liberating message we can have. And how much do we need that in our society today when there's so much pressure on us to perform in every area of our lives? We cannot do it on our own. Hallelujah, we cannot do it on our own. Someone has been provided to do it for us. We just need to be humble and repent and depend on him. It's a burden lifted. And uh, for us as we look out at a watching world, so we long for so many more people to experience that for themselves, don't we? Well, in our account, Nehemiah joins Ezra at this point as governor of the region and encourages the people not to become obsessed with their sin, rather to enjoy and celebrate what the Lord has done in bringing his word to his people. If we read the word and it brings a sobering response and helps us to realise where we've gone wrong, it's not for us to dwell in that. As Roman 8, Romans 8 makes clear, there is no condemnation for those of us who are now in Christ. It is for us to enjoy and celebrate what the Lord has done in bringing his word into our lives. And so Nehemiah enjoys his moment. He says, let's go and feast with the very best of food and he recommends not to leave anyone out. Feasting for the whole community without exception. Rather like our tea this evening, I think. On to our next slide. So, some of you may recognise this person. Anyone want to give a guess? That's William Wilberforce. Um, <clears throat> And um, he, of course, was a member of the Clapham group uh, who did all sorts of wonderful things. Um, of course, the, the uh, campaign against slavery most uh, famously. Uh, but I won't go off on that tangent because I can do 30 minutes on that on its own. So you're all right. I'm not going there now. Um, but uh, they, they were educationalists, business people, clergy people. But it was through the Clapham group that the British and Foreign Bible Society was created. 
Um, and of course, it was inspired by this young girl, Mary Jones. Some of you will have heard the story, I'm sure, um, who trekked 21 miles up and down mountains and valleys um, to get her own copy of the Bible in mid Wales. And uh, when she arrived, the um, minister there had just sold his last copy of the Bible. Um, so he gave her his three copies, his three personal copies. Uh, to head home and it was through that experience that he then approached another minister in Wales and said surely our mission should be that no one should not have access to a bible for themselves and they then brought that attention to William Wilberforce and friends to set up this movement so 200 years of bible societies all over the world lots of fantastic um, stories to tell and uh, as I said earlier, we're still involved in translation work and commissioning um, Bibles to be produced uh, for different parts of the world. On to our next slide. And um, there's a, a little girl called um, Tadala, and she has her first copy of the children's Bible there in Malawi. Um, and uh, what joy there is when people receive the Word of God. So going to show um, a, a three-minute clip now of a community who receive the New Testament for the very first time. So this is the moment that they receive the New Testament for the first time.
And uh, if you're interested in um, supporting that kind of work, we have our Bible a Month scheme, um, which is £5 a month. I've got some leaflets outside if you'd like to contribute um, to that uh, regularly. That provides a Bible um, every month for someone who doesn't have access to the Scriptures. The wonderful truth is that just in Ezra and Nehemiah's day, the Word of God still brings life and joy um, to communities and individuals all over the world. Um, you know, you may sometimes feel a little bit disheartened. You may sometimes think, um, is it really making any progress? Well, I can tell you absolutely it is. God's word is still continuing to bear fruit all over the world. Yes, we do face discouragements and setbacks, but um, just like in Ezra and Nehemiah's day, there is great joy when people open up the word of God and experience it for themselves. And especially when they meet Jesus as their saviour. For us as believers, it shows us that it is the truth and, dr and grace of Jesus Christ that is the hope of our lives and the hope of the world. May we treasure this book and the message it contains, for there is no hope without it. So let's have a few moments quiet, reflective, personal prayer, and then I'll lead us in some wider prayers. Our loving Heavenly Father, when where we have felt perhaps hardened or cold to your word, we pray this evening that by your Holy Spirit you would awaken us afresh. Help us in our daily lives to thirst for your word, to recognise its importance and how crucial it is for our understanding of the world around us. Forgive us, Father, when we relegate it to just another book or something else to fit into our day. Forgive us, Lord, when we act like that. And help us, inspire us and encourage us to devour it, to want to share it, to want to teach it, to want to give it away. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we pray for the church, your bride, we pray that the church in this nation would be a church where we are working hard to encourage Bible confidence, working hard to 
energize people for your word, giving them tools and resources that will help them to understand it and uh, to be able to share it. We pray for church leaders with their responsibilities being so wide ranging that you would help them to keep your word close to their hearts and give them the skills required to teach it well to individuals, small groups and congregations. And we pray for unity around your word in this nation that would help us all to uh, be united and on the same team as we uh, venture forward in explaining this wonderful book to people in the wider world. So help the church, we pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. <clears throat>